on this edition of Defense News Weekly. We sit down with former Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel to discuss his views on the world and President Trump. We'll also get a preview of the 2019 defense budget and see the highlights of the Pentagon's annual test report. With in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly. I'm Jeff Martin. The U.S. Navy says a Russian Su-27 fighter aircraft came within five feet of hitting a surveillance aircraft over the Black Sea. The plane, an EP-3 designed for electronic surveillance, was not damaged, but it did have to fly through the fighter's jet wash. This is just the latest in a string of incidents involving Russian aircraft and U.S. Navy ships and planes. Boeing suffers a defeat as the International Trade Commission rules that Boeing is not harmed by Canadian aircraft company Bombardier's deal with Delta Airlines. The U.S. Commerce Department ruled last year that the Canadian company unfairly received government subsidies and sold planes in the United States at artificially low prices. But the trade panel disagreed. Boeing says it's disappointed in the ruling. If you've ever used the running app Strava and have not checked the privacy settings, it's likely that your running routes are on the internet right now. And if you're a U.S. service member overseas, those routes show the boundaries of U.S. bases worldwide. The company says users need to review their privacy settings, but the discovery has sparked debate over what exactly Strava and other apps have not published. For more, visit C4ISRNet.com. General Dynamics says they'll pump more than $2 billion into their shipyards to meet growing demands. In last week's earnings call, this company's CEO said most of the money will go to the electric boat yard in Connecticut to help build the new version of the Virginia-class attack submarine and the Columbia-class ballistic missile submarine. In addition, about $200 million will go to Bath Iron Works in Maine and NASCO in San Diego. The Pentagon's annual test report is out, and as usual, some systems didn't fare too well. One of those was the Army's Active Protection System initiative, designed to protect armored vehicles from anti-tank missiles and other threats. According to the report, the program is delayed for the Bradley and Stryker vehicles for various reasons, including radar issues and power distribution problems and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter didn't escape notice. The test report criticized the program's modernization plan as unrealistic. To read more coverage of the test report, head over to defensenews.com. This week marked President Trump's first State of the Union address, and he was sure to mention his thoughts on where he wants America's military to go. Here's a look at what he said. Unmatched power is the surest means to our true and great defense. For this reason, I am asking Congress to end the dangerous defense sequester and fully fund our great military. We must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Since Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel left office in early 2015, he has been relatively quiet about his time in the Pentagon. But now, three years after being forced out, he's speaking to Defense News' Aaron Mehta about his time in office, the geopolitical state of the world, and whether or not President Trump is helping or hurting America. I think he's done great damage to the presidency, uh, his leadership to our country. Um, he, uh, in his first year, has... Uh, done everything to intentionally divide America. The former secretary didn't mince words when discussing his views on the current occupant of the Oval Office. You can have strong opinions, of course, and, and fight uh, mightily for what you believe. But in the end, you've got to make government work. You have to compromise. You've got to sort it out. You can't continue to vilify the other side and call them names. Do you believe President Trump, either his actions or his words, has made the world more dangerous? Well, I don't think he has helped uh, address the volatility and the danger in the world by his words and by his leadership. And one of the foremost issues on Hegel's mind is North Korea. With his tweets, my button's bigger than yours and fire and fury and we'll wipe you off the face of the earth and so on. That says to me he doesn't understand the consequences of a nuclear exchange. Uh, there's no winner in that. There's no winner in, in that and we must avoid that. We fortunately avoided that since World War II. We hear a lot about a uh, bloody nose strike, a strike that the U.S. was able to carry out on North Korea without triggering a nuclear or full-on war response. 
Do you believe that's a possibility? Well, if you want to bet that if you're going to attack North Korea, however way you're going to do that, and think that Kim Jong-un and the North Koreans are not going to retaliate, it's a pretty big gamble. I wouldn't want to take that gamble. I wouldn't want to take that gamble. I know something about this business, and I know the kind of ca conventional capability North Korea has, too. The secretary was unflinching in his comments on one of the most complicated issues facing Pentagon leaders today. In your mind, should transgender individuals be allowed to serve? Yes. People say there's a readiness crisis. People say transgender individuals will create issues inside units. Have you seen any evidence of it? Never seen any evidence of it. I don't think there's any evidence there. I've never seen it uh, in any way documented or I've never uh, heard any evidence of any evidence or seen facts. Hegel also talked about his views on government dysfunction, particularly in light of January's three-day shutdown. Uh, I hope we don't have to go through another one of these. I hope um, this short three-day shutdown period uh, uh, has uh, taught a lesson to uh, members of Congress who have it within their power and the presidency. Everybody who holds power has some responsibility that this is not in the interest in any way uh, for our country. In fact, it hurts our country. That needs to be recognized. You don't solve problems. You don't come to solutions or compromises over big issues by shutting governments down. There'll be political consequences, and there should be for people who advocate this, but it's, it's dangerously irresponsible. And uh, I'm hopeful that because of these 26 bipartisan members of the Senate uh, from, the, from the center left, center right, that they will continue to dominate the decision making and make this government uh, start to work again. That government dysfunction comes with a cost. Over the past several years, military leaders have steadily ramped up criticism of the budget process, something Hegel agrees with. When you're living day to day with continuing resolutions like we have been living the last few years, you can't plan. That means you, you introduce uncertainty into the system. And it's a terrible, terrible thing uh, for, uh, for our leaders. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. And sure, this is, I think, all part of, of the end result. Uh, now, I, I don't blame all of 2013. I don't blame all of this on continuing resolutions. Uh, there's more to it than that. But that certainly is there, and I think it, it is a factor. But in the middle of all this dysfunction, in Hegel's eyes, the United States' position in the world has diminished, particularly in Asia, where Hegel feels the Trump administration withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a mistake. Uh, China is, is everywhere. China lives there. China has influence in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, of course they're filling that vacuum. Of course they are. The Russians are filling it to some extent, too. The Indians will fill that vacuum. Of course it affects how we're seeing in our relationships. I hear from leaders in all those countries, leaders from all over uh, the world, meet with ambassadors all the time, and they have the same story. Uh, you are leaving a vacuum in these areas that the Chinese specifically are filling, and there will be no other way that this turns out. Unsurprisingly, another region that dominates Hegel's thinking is the Middle East. Look at the Middle East today. Saudi Arabia is in huge trouble. Uh, they've got uh, this problem with their own GCC partner of Qatar. How does that help them? Uh, they just undermine their own family cohesiveness over the last 70 years. They, they want to get more involved in Lebanon to try to drive out Hezbollah. Uh, they've got a fiasco going in Yemen. Iran actually gets stronger. You've got non-functioning governments in Libya, in Yemen essentially Syria, I mean, whatever the Russians, the Iranians tell him. Uh, Iraq is a balancing act between the U.S. interests and the Iranian interests. That's not going to change. You got Turkey uh, wh where they are. Uh, you got the GCC split, which, which was once a unifying important part of all this. Egypt sitting there in trouble with a, a president who's eliminating all, all of his potential opponents for his reelection. Um, then you got the Palestinian fiasco with the Jerusalem decision that the U.S. made. 
I don't know of a time when the Middle East has been more volatile or more dangerous. So what's more of a concern for you then regionally? Is it North Korea, which we've been told consistently is the greatest threat to the United States, or is the Middle East with all the instability going on there? Well, the, the most significant and immediate threat would be North Korea if they had the kind of capability they claim they have to deliver uh, a nuclear weapon uh, onto the soil of the United States. I mean, th that, that's an immediate threat. The Middle East is not an immediate threat to, to our homeland, to our security interests. Yes, it's a, it's a threat to everybody, but, but not the same uh, immediate threat that North Korea uh, presents. Many of the challenges in the region can be summed up by the situations in Syria and Afghanistan, both of which Hegel is intimately familiar with. Was it a mistake not to uh, go into Syrian force and respond to Assad after the use of chemical weapons? Well, we were going to do it, as you know. It was a, it was a decision made by the National Security Council, unanimous decision. I strongly favored it. At the last minute, the president decided not to do it. Um, I think it was a mistake. I said, I've said that. That got pulled off in, 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 the, in this exercise of working with the Russians to get precursors to chemical weapons out of Syria, which we never got all of them, of course. Syria was never going to give them all up. Um, but that was, wasn't a good resolution, I didn't think. Uh, actually, the Russians came up with the idea uh, after the president pulled down the, uh, the and revisited that idea uh, after the president pulled down the attack in Syria. But also, I would say, at the time, the Russians were not there. I think it sent a very clear message to the Russians, very clear. When the Russians saw that, that action, that was clear to them that we were not going to be players in Syria and we were not going to be involved. And what they did is they took their little naval base, which was nothing, in Latakia province at Tartus, and used that to build up with a, a, a huge air asset campaign, troops on the ground, intelligence, Navy, and now they've got a significant set of sophisticated assets in Syria and now really hold the cards. Do you believe the U.S. will ever be able to leave Afghanistan or Iraq? Well, I, yes, I do. I mean, at some point we're going to have to. After 17 years in Afghanistan, the situation is worse than it's ever been. I think the American people, the Congress of the United States, are going to start asking some pretty hard questions. It's not because the, the Amer American military failed, but the American military can't fix the problems in Afghanistan. Poppy production, corruption, tribal decisions, topography, all the uncontrollables that are there. You don't have to fix that with the military. You can put 10,000, 20,000. We tried that. We had over 100,000 troops in there for a number of years, 17 years. So, yeah, we're going to leave at some point, sure. Reporting from Washington for Defense News Weekly, I'm Aaron Mehta. To see and read more of our interview with Secretary Hagel, visit defensenews.com. And next week, Secretary Hagel reflects on his time in office, including a controversial confirmation hearing. I know I was considered by some Republicans as a traitor, that I would go to work for Barack Obama. And um, I, I just regretted that it got so personal which that did surprise me, and it bothered me. To keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple News and other platforms for the latest updates. And when we come back, get the latest on the 2019 budget and our take on the Super Bowl. Today's program is provided in part by Raytheon, proud partner of FifthDomain.com, the sister site of Defense News, dedicated to all things cyber. Learn more at FifthDomain.com. The 2019 defense budget is expected to drop this month, and reports say it will include a big increase in Pentagon spending. To find out more of what it might look like, I talked to Todd Harrison with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So first of all, Todd, 2019 budget, we're expecting it to come out later this month in February. What are kind of your thoughts on what we might see in this budget? Yeah, so uh, continuing the tradition of about the past 10 years, the budget is going to be late. 
about a week late behind the statutory deadline, so that's not too bad. Uh, what's been reported so far is that the total national defense budget will be $716 billion. Wow. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about that, so total national defense, that includes war funding, overseas contingency operations funding. Uh, it also includes the atomic energy related funding uh, that's outside of DOD, but it's still considered part of national defense. So for comparison, uh, the 2018 budget request, mm -hmm. uh, the same number, total national defense, was $668 billion. So this is a pretty substantial increase. It's a we're substantial increase. At. Yeah. Uh, now, if you look at the details, though, that have started to leak out, that's where it gets interesting. So presumably, uh, the atomic energy funding part of the budget, it'll continue on the trajectory it was already on. Um, it's relatively small, about $29 billion out of the, the request. Um, now, Bloomberg reported that the base DOD budget, mm -hmm. so not including war funding, was going to be $597 billion. That's not that much of an increase compared to what was already planned. Uh, so in 2018, they requested, I think, $574 billion in the base DOD budget. Um, that, of course, hasn't been enacted yet. Nope. Uh, and in 2019, they had projected they would request $585 billion. So 597, uh, I'm sorry, 587. Uh, and so 597 is only about 10 billion more than they had already been planning in the base budget. So this isn't the massive Trump era defense buildup we were told we would get in 19. Well, but then look at OCO. OCO is the remainder. Mm -hmm. So if those numbers as reported are right, mm -hmm. 597 in the base um, and about 29 billion to atomic energy, 716 billion total, what's left over is 90 billion in OCO funding. So it looks like uh, a lot of the increase will actually be in the OCO part of the budget. So there's a buildup, but it's not in the w it's not funded in the way that we were expecting. Interesting. One thing we hear from the we've heard from the Pentagon is that you know 19 is another is kind of a, a market increase, and then 20, that's the big one. That's the masterpiece budget. Does that kind of seem to be in line with what you've heard and everything like that? Yeah, you know the Deputy Secretary Shanahan has said that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, take them at their word, and it kind of makes sense because a lot of the senior officials uh, in the Pentagon, the senior presidentially appointed officials, they weren't in place uh, for much of this budget development process. Of course, you know, the, the Pentagon budget, this FY19 budget started being developed more than a year ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the services had finished up their budgets and were submitting them for final review, the program review process, uh, in the late summer about the time that the new deputy secretary got there. So there's only so much that this team could have done to have influenced uh, mm -hmm. this budget request. Uh, maybe some big muscle movements, but it's not comprehensive. They didn't build this from the bottom up. So I understand why they're saying, well, stay tuned for the FY20 budget next year. They will have had the opportunity to build that one from the bottom up. So we will see that fully reflect all of their priorities. Uh, but in the meantime, FY19 should reflect some of the big movements that are going to be necessary to implement the national defense strategy. Mm -hmm. The caveat being that some of these things may be funded in OCO. And if, if they do as they've done in the past, the OCO budget is submitted for one year at a time. We don't get a five-year plan, so we may not be able to see in this budget request where some of these initiatives are going in the long run. So the waters are pretty murky on what the buildup really could be at this yes. point. And with the OCO budget, that's been kind of accused by some in Congress, especially and the current OMB director, kind of being a slush fund, yet we could see an increase this year. Mm -hmm. So is that just narrative coming out, or do you think they might actually in the future have some impact on the OCO budget? You know, it's interesting. I think this has got to be part of the, the battle, the game going on between Mattis and Mulvaney. Uh, of course, Mattis is over there, you know, uh, pushing the White House for more defense funding to fully implement the defense strategy. Mulvaney is a fiscal hawk. He's a budget hawk. Um, and he has been highly critical of OCO funding when he was a member of Congress. Uh, he called it a slush fund. He called it dishonest uh, in his uh, confirmation hearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, Mulvaney, I, you got to think, has been pushing back on all this. But, um, you know, this may have been the way they got to an agreement between Mattis and Mulvaney. Mulvaney may have said, hey, I'll give you your increase, but if we put it in OCO, Mulvaney knows that means it's just one year that Mattis has won. If Mattis wants to continue growing the budget or even just sustain this level of funding in the future, he has to come back and fight the White House for it year after year after year. Uh, it doesn't lock it into the baseline if you put it in OCO. Classic Washington. Todd, thanks so much for <laughs> talking with us. We appreciate it. Glad I could do it.
The issue of paternity leave has been a complicated one in the military. So recently, when the military senior enlisted leader, Command Sergeant Major John Troxell, visited Military Times, reporters asked him his thoughts on the issue. When you look at where career, careers start to get derailed, especially when we look at diversity and we look at uh, female uh, service members and their ability to grow and develop and reach senior positions, generally when they start having a family, um, that's where things start to, uh, you know, kind of derail them off that, you know, band of excellence that they're moving in. So we want to make it easier on a family when they have children. It shouldn't be, well, I'm having a child, now I have to focus on my family instead of my career. We've proven in the military that you can be a great warrior and you can also be a great parent. So we wanted to have this policy in place that allows the family to take the time to bring this new addition into their family, whether it's through birth or adoption or whatever it is. Having said what I said, this is a service issue, okay? So um, my service senior enlisted advisors, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, the Sergeant Major of the Army, they are the ones that really focus on that because in the end it's going to be a service implemented policy. Even though DOD, we're looking at a common policy here. Um, so uh, between us, you know, when we dialogue and then when we go and dialogue with Congress, uh, we make sure that we're sending the message on where we want to go with this. Don't go away. When we come back, get our take on the Super Bowl and what it means for America's military. On this week's Money Minute, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers her tips on raising your credit limits. When you apply for a credit card, you're given a certain spending limit based on your income and credit worthiness. After a while, you may be offered a chance to increase your credit limit, but should you? There are some good reasons to add to your limit, especially if you manage your debt and payments well. More credit increases your purchasing power and helps lower the amount of debt you're using compared to your limits. This could also raise your credit score since it suggests that you're living within your means. But if you're going to spend that extra credit, it could suggest the opposite. The general rule is to use 30% or less of your limit, so think carefully before you ask for an increase. Evaluate your reasons for wanting it. If you're looking for flexibility or lower credit usage, go for it. But if you need it because you're strapped for cash, you could be doing more harm than good. Talk to a trusted financial advisor to see if raising your credit limit is your next right move. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more Defense News coverage, be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and subscribe to our early bird brief, delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. And when we return, two of our reporters go head to head in their predictions on Super Bowl 52. SHOT Show is an annual trade show for shooting, hunting, and firearm industries. It's also a place to see the latest in weapons, ammunition, and assorted equipment. Military Times ground combat reporter Todd South attended the event and found something that could make it easier for troops to hit their targets. So one major thing that all the development programs for both the Army and the Marine Corps are doing is looking at ways to take all the many variables out of the shooter loop. So basically a soldier Marine, all they have to do is line things up and then squeeze a the trigger. Now one thing we saw here today from tracking point is a very computerized system that only allows a shooter to fire once the, the, the aim point is on target. Now it'll give you a red indicator kind of zooming into that target and then once you completely, completely squeeze, it fires off once things are lined up. Now of course you don't want to just shoot whenever the computer tells you to. You have a suppressive mode where the weapon will fire at any point. However, you can guide it better, you can look into it better, you can take all those variables out of the shooter loop, making it much easier for the shooter to do that. It also has a live feed to a smartphone, so you can analyze your performance recorded, or you can have a spot to tell you where you're hitting on target to make adjustments. Super Bowl 52 begins soon, so I sat down with two of our big super fans to get their take on the game and what it means for America's military. With the Super Bowl fast approaching, we asked two of our most insufferable fans in our entire newsroom, Leo Shane with the Eagles and Aaron Meadow with the Patriots, and I as your dejected Vikings fan after this horrible playoff season, to kind of see what team would be best for both the American military and American national security to win. So, Leo, what's your It's argument? obviously the Eagles. I mean, look, if it was a matter of gameplay, the defense department is going to go with the better defensive team, and that's the Eagles by every metric. But we're talking about who's going to inspire the troops more. And what do we hear from military commanders? We hear about modernization and readiness all the time. Which team is more ready? Which team lost their starting quarterback, their starting running back, their 
starting middle linebacker and still stayed focused Someone on the mission. Someone called that luck. Someone still called that Still stayed luck. focused on the mission, relied on their training, and managed to make it to the Super Bowl. And the other issue is modernization. What do we want to hear? Do we want a new quarterback, a new coach? Or do we want the old same storyline, the oldest coach in, in, in all of football, uh, the oldest quarterback in all of football? Look, if you're in favor of the F-22 restart and old equipment, right, that's right, fine. Right, right, but what's your argument? Here's the point. That's ridiculous. Here's why. One, Patriots also lost their starting wide receiver, their starting middle linebacker. Their quarterback is 40, okay, unheralded. Okay, you both got injured, okay? You both got injured. More to the injured. point. Want to talk about modernization, Leo? This team changes every year. You say it's the same old? It's not true at all. Every year, different team, different people come in. Belichick makes it all work. Just like the U.S. military takes the things they have to do, gets the job done no matter what the You've situation is. You've got the is. army of one with Tom Brady argument here, and the army rejected that. It's ridiculous. You're just, you guys are toast. You don't understand, Leo. That's the thing. <laughs> Like many of your fans, you understand what the warfighter needs, you understand what the people need. This is ridiculous. This is terrible, just terrible. Okay, you two, with that, we're going to close this out. Please enjoy yeah, the game not, and go to defensenews.com to see more of this At least we're not Vikings fans. Yeah, that's true. It's good to be Vikings fans. If you want to see more of that conversation, again, head to defensenews.com. That's all we have time for this week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.